welcome back super mums tonight we are doing a live webinar with the amazing natalie Britt from a big happy life you are our habits expert because this has been is habits month at the time of recording and if you're catching up with this on youtube then you may have missed habits month but you will still be able to catch up with all the content on all our various platforms and things like that but tonight is going to be where the magic happens i'm very excited about this i'm fascinated by habit formation and how it's used to like design your life and that we basically are a stream of our habits really um, but you hear, hear me talk enough, so I'm going to be quiet um, and kick over to you. And my first question, can you give us a brief overview of what you do with Big Heavy Life and what drew you to the study of habit? Yeah, um, well, I, I basically solve two problems. Um, the first problem is if you have tried and tried and tried to do something and you're still trying, um, often it's things like losing weight or giving up alcohol or doing something that we feel we should do. And a lot of people try that um, and haven't had success with it for whatever reason. Um, then I help people kind of backtrace it and work out how to adjust their habits so that that actual process, the process of achieving that goal becomes easier. And the second problem that I solve is for people who think when I achieve X, I'll be happy. Again, I help them backtrace to look at how do you achieve X and be happy while the process is taking place. Mm -hmm. So you don't have that kind of sense of I'm going to kill myself all the way until I get where I'm going and then I'll be happy. Mm. So those two things I deal with. And I suppose what got me into habits in the first place was um, I'm a corporate trainer and um, Big Happy Life is a new business that I'm moving into. And with my work with leaders in organizations, what I found was that very often really big problems could be traced back to really small habits. So what you end up with is people going, you know, this seems insurmountable. But in actual fact, when you look at the way people operate on a day to day basis, the, the tiny things they do without ever thinking about it. Those things, if changed, would take the problem away. And so I really started getting fascinated by the tiny things that people do without thinking about it that have these massive effects in their lives. It's, it's funny. Um, so I've just, at the time of recording, I've just got back from holiday and uh, there were lots of activities and one of them were these stand up paddle boards. Uh, you know, you're, they look like the giant surfboards and you stand with the paddle. There will be pictures coming on my social media. You can all have a good laugh at soon. Um, <laughs> But I have, uh, I'm very tall, I'm 5'11", and I became very tall basically overnight as a kid, which meant my balance went out the window. And ever since, I've said, I've got really bad balance. So on the first day we went out on these paddle boards, I carried on with my habit of saying that, and I sort of went up and down and got up, I got up on my feet and went down to my knees, and I said, oh, no, don't worry, I'll take my time. I've got really bad balance. And then I went, hang on a minute. That's, that's me saying that is a habit. There's actually no evidence to back that up anymore. I do a lot of single leg balances in yoga and things like this. And I went, I need to stop saying that. It's just a habit that I'm saying that. You know, as soon as I stopped saying it, I was up and I didn't manage a headstand on a sup. Lots of us were trying to do headstands on there, but I did manage some balance, yoga balance poses on a giant foamy surfboard in the ocean like amazing because i got rid of that tiny habit and i i mean there's so many different ways that things i see it a lot with people's weight they can have a really healthy diet but they've got a one tiny funny habit actually of eating something they don't really like and changing that tiny little habit makes all the difference it's i i do find habits fascinating yeah um, and i talk i talk about this a lot with it's um using your habits to design your life. So what does the phrase designing your life really mean to you? As we're sort of talking about that a bit more this evening. Well, this one, this one's really close to my heart because um, I've actually developed a model that I've yet to launch in Big Happy Life, but the first part of it is called design. And the reason that I did that was because I think what many of us often do is we set goals for ourselves but those goals pull against each other. So as an example, one of my goals is to write a book, 
But one of my other goals and the, the goal that drew me to you in the first place is I want to be the best mom I can be. And so very often, well, unless I had a design that allowed me to achieve both of those goals simultaneously, mm-hmm. what I run the risk of doing is I overbalance one with the other. Or when I'm with my children, I'm thinking, oh, I should be writing. Or when I'm writing, I'm thinking, oh, I should be with my children. So for me, a designed life or creating that design is about saying, how do all the pieces fit together? You're creating something that has a lot of moving parts. And in order to make the most of it and really enjoy the time you're using to do any of the things you're doing, it's really useful to think about how the whole thing fits together. What's important to you? Why it's important to you? What lights you up? And kind of bringing those elements into your day-to-day habits that allow you to achieve the goals in all those various areas. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's quite interesting when we start sort of looking at our lives of what is something that is not our character, is just a habit, mm-hmm. which I found quite interesting recently of really things that I used to say oh that's just me and I can't change that about me and I was like oh no actually that's just a habit I've got if I don't want that habit anymore I can get rid of it it might take a bit of work to get rid of it and they do creep back and I know there's um on your podcast you've talked about how they're kind of they're there and can be reignited I'm phrasing that wrong but um how they can they're sort of they do become a part of you but you're not allowing them to sort of be in control and things anymore which I find really interesting yes. um, so it's um yeah it's it's sort of pick and choosing and what it's so frustrating I mean the bad habits are so much easier to start than the easy ones so how is it that habits form well habits in order to explain how habits form it's kind of useful if you can bear with me for a sec to just talk a little bit about the brain Mm -hmm. um and The most, I suppose, just to make it as as simple and quick as possible is to just talk about the conscious and the subconscious. And um, a really fascinating book on the subject is a book by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. And basically, the, the, the easiest way to describe it is to say you've got your conscious brain or your conscious mind and your subconscious mind. The conscious mind is really limited in what it can do and how fast it works. And the subconscious mind is really fast. It can, it can process literally thousands of things at the same time. Whereas the conscious mind, the popular belief is, they, they say seven plus or minus two. So the, what that means is seven, but on a really, really good day, you can probably push to nine, and on a bad day, you go down to five. And what what habits are there to do is to say okay you've only got this small amount of capacity in your conscious mind let's just farm this stuff out i'll take care of it and so what the conscious mind does is it looks for patterns in your life uh sorry the subconscious does is it looks for patterns and once it finds a pattern it locks that into place and says okay when i see that thing i know to do this yeah. So it runs the thing for you. Um, the phrase very popular in, in kind of pop culture neuroscience is neurons that fire together, wire together. So quite <laughs> connections form in your brain and the, the neuron that goes, okay, that happens, will literally wire to and get sealed in with mm-hmm. the one that says, now do that. And so that makes it really difficult. So as an example, um, if you, I need to explain actually how habits form, but I'll do that in a second. Um, If you have, let's say a habit where at three o'clock you're at your desk and you normally eat a cookie Mm. and that becomes something you do, then the minute you look at the clock, that neuron's fired, the other one's already reaching for the cookie. The other one's going, send signal to hand, get cookie. Um, so in that happens so quickly, but your conscious mind is much slower. I mean like 10 times slower, maybe more than that even. And the, 
the capacity it has is way smaller as well. So you basically are pitting David against Goliath. Um, I think if you've, if you've heard the podcast, you've heard me talk about the elephant and the rider. Yes, yes, I love that book. Yeah, and that's, that's what this is. So um, that was um, a gentleman called Jonathan Haidt. He said, if the, the conscious mind is like the rider and the subconscious is the elephant. So, and if you think about them in terms of that power dynamic, mm -hmm. so now you've got one that's way more powerful and way faster to then be pitted against the weaker, slower one. And it's the weaker, slower one who's saying, don't eat the cookie. But the fast one's like, get out of my way, I'm having the cookie. So that's, that's the challenge. Um, but I think your question was about how habits form, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so sorry that I've done that bit about the brain. Um, so habits- yeah, part of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, habits have three parts or, um, are believed to have three parts. And the first is the trigger. So that's the thing that makes you do the habit. The second is the routine. And the third is the reward. So what you get from it. Now triggers can be, oh gosh, all kinds of things. They can be time of day, mood, um, other people, places. There's all kinds of things that whenever that trigger is present, your brain goes, oh, do that thing yeah. and you get something from it. So what, what happens is that whole thing gets packaged together. And as soon as you experience the trigger, you are likely to run the routine. So this is the other problem that a lot of us have is we address the routine. And this is another reason why bad habits are hard to break because we say, okay, don't eat the cookie at three o'clock. But if you don't know exactly what the trigger is, because it might be, just the time of day, but it's unlikely. It's more likely to be that there's boredom, that maybe you're tired, that you need a break, that you actually value social interaction and you go down to the canteen to get a cookie. And it's yeah. actually the walking down and the seeing people that gives you the buzz, not the cookie itself. Um, that, that's one of the reasons it's difficult is often we address the behavior, but what we really need to look at is the trigger and the reward because those are the that's what starts the process the trigger and the reward is what you get from it i realized that um i was always having bowls of nibbly bits so nuts or little bits of cheese or something mm -hmm. so and my trigger was sitting down at one end of the sofa because it's a point in the afternoon where we've normally done whatever activities we've done and I'm not working anymore and I've got the little one mm. um, and we'll either sit down or maybe do coloring on a good day on a bad day or watch TV for like the last sort of half an hour before daddy gets home or before we need to put supper on. And if I sit the other end of the sofa, it doesn't trigger me. How interesting. <laughs> it's so I'm like, there's, I mean, the bad end of the, what I'm calling now the bad end of the sofa has a little table next to it. Uh -huh. There's a massive coffee table in front of all of the lengths of the sofa. And there's a window sill at the other end if I really wanted to. But yeah, yeah, if I don't sit at that end of the sofa, I'm not triggered to want anything. It's yeah. so weird. <laughs> it's really fascinating. And that's the kind of thing, you know, the sleep experts talk about don't, don't work in your bedroom. Yeah. Do this, do that. And it's those kinds of things because your brain is really context driven. So you'll behave in a particular way, in a particular space. And even if you think about the language we use, we say things like in the first place, in the second place. Um, I did this training with Jim Quick, um, the memory expert. And one of the techniques he uses is to try is to memorize, to put things that you want to remember Imagine, imagine a room you know and put those things in the room because your brain will hold them so well. So it's really quite easy to see how something so simple as moving, as moving your position could give you enough of a distance from the habit, from the routine, for your brain to go, okay, fine, this isn't, this isn't a trigger, it's okay. And for you to be able to let that go then. Yeah. Um, well, quite often it is, I just need a drink. I'm not actually hungry at all, but yeah. that's... That's so often the way, isn't it? And I say it to my clients all the time. I'm like, 
you're not hungry have a drink or have a glass of water first that's one of the best like healthy habits because you consume loads of water and it gives your body a chance to go actually was i hungry did i need something um it's one of my sort of i hate the word diet but it's one of my like top diet tips is every before every every time you'll go to eat something meal snack or otherwise have a big glass of water um because it sort of limits the space and it sort of checks if you're actually thirsty and it gives your hands and your mouth something to do that isn't consuming mcdonald's um but it's 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 crazy how so many things that we want to do with our lives and how we want to live our lives are like tied up in identifying the good habits and the bad habits and getting rid of habits and bringing new habits in to yeah design the life that you want it's yeah it's amazing but like we said the bad habits are the the big tricky thing what's the sort of most common stumbling blocks you find when creating the new habits so when you're trying to bring the good ones in what's often the the biggest trick uh, biggest stumbling block i think probably what i was saying before that people generally will tend to focus on the routine and not a lot of people put in the effort it takes to work out what the triggers are and what the rewards are and i think very often particularly where food is concerned it's somebody put it really beautifully the other day i can't remember who it was but she said it's not what you're eating it's what's eating you yes i love that phrase yeah and it's when you look at rewards very often it's not the food itself but there's something coming from it some kind of maybe you're numbing out stress or you know there's some kind of emotional link with childhood or you know it reminds you of something like there are all kinds of really quite hidden reasons why we do the things we do. Um, One lady who I was working with, um, we kind of uncovered that actually for her, the idea of being slim and attractive was quite threatening for her because her relationship previously was one that had ended really badly. She was incredibly hurt. She was treated quite badly in the relationship as well. And the thought of being attractive enough to be of interest to somebody else was so challenging for her that actually, even though when she looked in the mirror, she was, she thought, I want to lose weight. I want to go on a diet. I want to do these things. It wasn't until we dug really deep yeah. and realized that there's a part of her that's her subconscious is holding her safe in the best way it possibly can. Because for her, the idea of being the, the person she envisaged at the end of that diet was actually going to cause her much more stress. So until we could help her make peace with that, the food really wasn't the issue at all. Yeah. I, I love evaluation. I do a, a weekly review and sort of really make sure I'm constantly staying on top of evaluating my life so that I can make the changes that are causing problems. Like I knew just before I went on a holiday that I wasn't coherent in life. Like I could string a few sentences together, but I was mucking up with things, simple things left, right and center. And I think it was sort of possible early burnout, but because I constantly evaluate, I was like, I feel this creeping in. And so even though I took my laptop away with me, I did not get it out. My partner struggled to connect his to the Wi-Fi, And I was like, that's it. That's the final sign. Not meant to get my laptop out and to have that quiet thing. But that evaluate, constant evaluation has really helped me stay on top of things and that was something through that I learned through my fitness because you need to constantly evaluate your workout so you're not hitting sort of plateau stages and things you're constantly growing muscle which was the sort of goals that I had pre-baby and was to keep going back and reassessing and if we don't reassess our past we don't find out what's eating us do we if we don't like you're saying her going back to the relationship causing her hurt and how that was stopping her yes. moving forward um, is and it's not letting obviously those things that you evaluate take control over your life it's you evaluating so you can take control yes. over your life yeah <laughs> I don't feel like I'm as <laughs> still not completely coherent but. so yes the mind mindset I think yeah really no getting into sort of what is the initial problem I find really interesting. I've been doing um, some work on my money mindset side mm-hmm. of things. Um, and 
it was funny. I I had two occasions that I know had affected my body confidence and my belief that I was fat and these sort of become your own self-fulfilling prophecy and things like that. And and one of them was a girl at school who actually was a lot bigger than me and she called me fat because I was sat down and my skin rolled on my tummy, which yeah. now I know is normal. Yeah. Um, and then the other one was something my dad had said that I knew it affected my body confidence. And what it is, is it also affected my money mindset. And it left me with the belief that um, you have to be thin to earn money. Oh, interesting. We were in a fish and chip shop up north and the guy, comment, the guy serving us commented on how tall I was. And uh, my dad said something along the lines of, uh, yes, if she'd stop eating, we could have made some money out of her. Now, my dad is not malicious in any way, and I, he would have been a fleeting comment. He wouldn't have even thought about it. He'd have thought it was funny because I was known as being a bit of a bottomless pit when it came to eating, because um, I was eating my feelings. <laughs> and, and, uh, but it's funny how that, t until I identified that, I felt like I was never going to be financially successful until I was thin, but I hadn't really registered it. And not only have I been much better with my finances since spotting that what was eating me, I've got thinner. <laughs> it's quite ironic, isn't it? <laughs> not, not, I think this was my goal, but I'm, I discovered another area of training that I really enjoyed. And actually, I'm closest to my goal body than I have ever been. Amazing. Having identified that that was what the power that that was having over me and how that was impacting all the habits and things in my life. It just blows your mind, absolutely blows your mind. Um, it's fascinating. And that's, it's all that stuff that's all, because the subconscious has that all stored away, mm. and it's quite difficult to get to it. Yeah. That's another reason why habits are so hard to break, because all that, you're working from what feels like the whole picture, but it's not. It's a tiny, yeah. tiny corner of your mind, and everything else is happening almost under the surface. Mm. So you've got to, You've got to really want to go after that stuff because yeah. it takes a lot of work. I've done, I mean, I've done some bits myself reading books and listening to podcasts and things. And I have mm. spent some time working with a coach and that's been amazing, but that's not always obtainable for some people. One finance or it just can be quite nerve wracking. The idea of working one on one with someone and we're seeing more and more like habit trackers and accountability groups and stuff. Yes. sort of set up and do you think there's a beneficial do you, uh, are there any particular sort of structures that you you would recommend with that kind of thing I think it depends on the individual um it's really it's really difficult to say yes they definitely work or no they don't because for a lot of people they're exactly the thing you need to keep you on track. Um, because one of the best things you can do is check in with yourself. Um, in order to explain this again, there's so many pieces. Um, see, the person who sets the goal, the you who sets the goal is usually the one who has some distance uh, from that kind of crux moment where you're gonna have to make the choice. So that person, is probably really good at habit trackers and you know wants accountability. But the person who is faced in that moment with, eh, do I do it, don't I? Is obviously less likely to be interested in that kind of thing. So habit trackers work because they it's a way of checking in with that strong version of you and giving yeah. it the reins m m with more power. Yeah. But what can happen, and certainly it's, it's happened in my case, is I just found it as being one more thing I had to do. So um, I ended up putting it to one side. However, it is something that I would return to for a habit that I really wanted to track. Yeah. So I think that's the key is, if you're gonna track all your habits, it's just gonna become another thing that's gonna irritate you in the end. Whereas if there is a thing you're gonna do for a period of time and doing it requires you 
to keep reminding yourself of, the, of who you are aiming to be and of what you're aiming to do, then I think they do a wonderful job. The very cool thing um, that I got out of a habit tracker was that I, I thought I had the balance right with my kids. Um, my children are adopted and so quite a lot of my parenting is very conscious and very deliberate um, in an effort to build connections the way a birth family might take for granted, but an adoptive family simply can't. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things I had in my habit tracker was that I wanted to play with each child on a one-to-one -one basis, on a daily basis. So to find a way that the one child is kept occupied while I can give the other child full attention and then switch. Yeah. Um, and I thought that the balance would be shifted towards my son because my, he's not at school yet and my daughter is. Um, and so when I kept a habit tracker, what I actually found was that in many cases, my play with him was quite haphazard and random because I'd go off and do the dishes or I'd go off and do something else. And when I actually sat down to go, did I really play with him today in, in a focused child led mommy follows you way. And a lot of the times I had to go, no, I, I, I didn't. He I was, he was with me all day, but he didn't get his 15 minutes today. Whereas my daughter, she's out of the house for most of the day and she was getting that. Now, I don't know that I would have picked that up without the habit tracker. Yeah. So from that perspective, when you've got little things that you're relying on your memory for to see whether or not you're kind of progressing, then I think actually the habit tracker can do something really valuable. But for me, um, and certainly with the, the few clients I've worked with, they seem to have a limited lifespan. Yeah. Actually, one thing that is really helpful is something that um, I want to say Malcolm Gladwell, and I know that's the wrong name. The book is called Triggers, Marshall Goldsmith. Um, he uses something called active questions, mm. which I guess it's a bit like a habit tracker, but it's where you set yourself a question. Did I do my best to blah, 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 whatever it is. Um, and so that's kind of, it couples mindset with some kind of habit tracker. And I found those really valuable. So you can use that in a journal. Um, if you just Google um, Marshall Goldsmith active questions, there's a PDF that comes up, loads of little helpful things in there. Um, and that kind of saves you to do all the, the using the habit tracker app or whatever. Um, but it also helps you shift your mindset, which I think is really a huge part of habit change anyway. Hmm. it's um suddenly reminds me ha talking habit trackers we've just tried to introduce the new habit to our daughter of going to the loo in the potty and not um. her nappy otherwise known as the fun stage of potty training and she's had a star chart but we've been able to see how many times she's been to the loo that day because obviously if they start getting too conscious to go on it they can get bunged up and it can be a health issue so we kind of needed to be able to track her new habit and see how she was getting on from a health point of view yeah. and I've actually got so many star stickers left over from it I bought these star chart things and they came with obscene amounts of star stickers so I'm now like oh I want to make myself a star chart for something I need to start another I need to start a new habit so I can make myself a star chart <laughs> I'm very much a gold star like tick off person I like yeah. someone being like yes you're getting this right yes yes that's right just keep going or whatever it is that I'm doing or yes gold star you're I'm I mean I must drive my partner nuts with those it's, it's, it's <laughs> yes yes you look nice today dear yes I feel <laughs> loved <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna create a star chart for that like am I being a good partner star chart and am I being a good mum star chart and the two of them can star me off at the end of each day. Yeah. <laughs> Although what will happen if they don't? Oh, I'll adjust my habits to improve oh. my life, to design my life. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we've talked a lot about sort of the serious side of it and the serious sort of mindset side of it and things like that. Um, so 
although we're getting into the giggly stage talking about posture training, aren't we? Um, what was the most, I'm going for a funny question, well not a funny question here, I find these questions are often more interesting ones, um, the most outwardly weird but inwardly awesome habit you've ever had? Oh, uh, this is an easy one actually. Um, cold showers every day. Yeah, I see. I find that outwardly, outwardly weird. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I tell people, they're like, why? Why would you do that? It's hideous. Um, yeah, so I started on the 9th of December last year um, taking cold showers. And I did it because of a documentary that I saw um, where I saw a man called um, Wim Hof, or Wim Hof, and he, his nickname is the Iceman. And he basically does, uh, you know, marathons in the Arctic in a pair of shorts. Um, and he holds the record for being submerged, submerged in ice for the longest period of time. Um, and basically people were like, he, he's just a random weird guy, but he is way healthier. Um, and they've done all these tests on him. Um, calmer, just kind of more centered and, so I was really interested in it. And then somebody I really respected mentioned him again. And I thought, okay, I'm going to give it a try. And I did. And the really, the weirdest thing happened. It, I've been trying to find a way to connect my conscious mind and my subconscious mind more effectively. Mm -hmm. And the, the breathing technique that goes with the cold shower. So you do the breathing first and then you, you get in the shower. Yeah. Um, and I found that those things created that kind of synchronicity between conscious and subconscious mind. And I found I was more patient with my kids. Mm. I found that, well, I had, until that point, I would have said that I was at, at best an over-enthusiastic drinker. Um, and I'm pretty close to teetotal now. And that was six months ago. And I think the reason that that happened was because the cold shower does two things for me every day. The first is that it creates this spike of <gasps> and then the necessity to calm myself immediately. So I get this physical stressor and then a physical calm. And so what's ended up happening, certainly in terms of my stress levels with my kids, is I come back so much faster. And when I feel that tension rise in my body, it's like there's a trip switch that I can come back down so much more easily than I ever could before. Um, and I, I can only attribute it to that because nothing really, nothing else has changed majorly in the last six months. So that was the first one. And the second one is just like everybody, I have the days where I just think, oh God, I can't. And I have to get in that shower and I switch it to cold because you get in, you have sort of 20, 30 seconds in hot water first and then straight to cold. Yeah. And every day it's a reminder that I'm going somewhere. I'm this person now. I'm doing it. Yeah. And it sort of resets. It's, I guess, a bit like a habit tracker. It's that moment of reconnecting with the you you want to be that says, mm -hmm. you've got this. You're okay. Carry on. Yeah. And for that reason, as much as it seems like such a, a crazy thing to do, in terms of mindset and resilience and just strength, I find it utterly invaluable. I feel like I'd more likely be able to do it in the summer, but in the winter, as soon as it turns cold, I feel it in my like soul. Yeah. I like the internals of my bones are cold and it's, I have to have some soreness through the winter because otherwise I feel like an internal ice cube. Yeah. My daughter is always hot. She never wants a, never wants cardio, never wants the socks and you'll feel the back of her neck and she'll be fine. She'll be absolutely yeah. normal temperature. And I'll be like, more clothes, more clothes. Yeah. Um, I did, I did have a cold shower after the sauna the other day and it did feel nice. I stepped under, it has like three button options and I stepped under it under warp. Uh -huh. And then it's cold and it gradually gets colder. Yes. And that was a bit more me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I did, your skin feels better and you get a better glow about you and things. But it's. And you know, two potentially interesting benefits from cold showers 
The first one, it increases your brown fat, which means you burn more calories. So it's easier to lose weight if you have a cold shower on a daily basis. And the second thing is I am the same. I'm a South African living in the UK. I used to be cold all the time. If we went out to a restaurant and the waiter said, can I take your coat? He'd have to stand there for about six or seven minutes while I took off the multiple layers I was wearing because I would never go out with less than two coats on and usually yeah. two or three layers underneath that. Since taking cold showers this winter, I had one coat, like a normal person. It didn't feel the cold. I got in the swimming pool. Ah. It's not a heated pool. I got in the pool on New Year's Day. It was yeah. seven degrees in the pool and I was fine. Maybe so, I'll try and like, I feel like if I'm going to be able to do it, it's going to be over the, the summer period. And then I, I'm better at maintaining then. Starting more new things for me in the summer, I find so much interesting. Yeah. It's so much easier, which plays up to my number one rule for life, which is know thyself and thyself likes to start things in the summer. I just, just generally feel more energized and productive and I'm, so I'm making sure I up my workouts over the summer. And so by the winter, they're a habit. Yes. And I'm used to going and it's set in place with what I'm doing. And yes. because over last winter, I was three sessions a week and I want to be back up to my six sessions, my pre-baby right. six sessions, which is excessive for most people, but is in line with my goals. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> where you got to go. Yeah. Um, and what do you get your inspiration from for new habits you said you'd watch that the documentary and things you sound a bit like me i'm a, I'm a questioner i need lots of information to be able to start a new habit but is there specific places that you go to, to, to find new habits that you think would impact your life to help you design the life you want i'd probably say well i'm i'm a bit of a bookworm so probably books would be my number one source of of inspiration um, and I suppose now, now that I've made it kind of my life, mm. I'm pretty open to most sources and I'm pretty open to trying stranger things, particularly in the last six months since the cold showers, I've been a bit more open to just going, you know, what, what might this hold? So, you know, years ago, I would have said absolutely no to fasting as an example, because the way you describe yourself about cold, I am about food. Um, the idea of being hungry just absolutely stresses me out. I'm definitely, uh, my relationship with food has been troubled for a lot of my life anyway. Um, so the idea of doing something like that, I thought would actually just mess with my mental health. Whereas these days, you know, somebody mentioned it to me and I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I go off and usually then back to books and I go and do some research. So if I hear something, if I see something on a documentary, if I um, see something in a Facebook group or whatever, then usually if it catches my interest, my next port of call would be a book. And from there, I then just try it and see what I get out of it. But I've done quite a lot of work in understanding the reward triggers in my own mind. Um, so I usually will then shape a habit so that in some way it links to something I know will make the elephant happy or want a better way to put it. I, I, my easiest one is to generally surround myself with people that are living like the life I want and things, in a, which is usually in a digital format because some of the things I want in my life are a bit more out there and, kind of hard to meet someone on the street that's trying to go after those things yes. so I will put just on in the background um fitness different fitness workouts different bloggers and youtubers talking about fitness things that they like and stuff like that just so I'm surrounded more by the people that have the life I want and listening to their habits and stuff like that which is quite interesting because we'll we can get a bit stuck in the circle of who we hang out with both physically and digitally and they're not necessarily living the life you want. Like I, I have the guilty pleasure TV as well. I love um, Real Housewives in New York City, um, Made in Chelsea sometimes, but that's kind of, those two are kind of my peak. I wouldn't want that to be the only thing I watched on TV because none of them are really living the kind of life I want to live. Well, okay, they've got lots of money and really nice clothes, but 
a lot of them are quite miserable and they're drinking a lot and they're partying a lot and they're not really necessarily achieving very much with the exception of Bethany Frankel on The Real Housewives of New York because she is golden as far as I am concerned <laughs> um, but but a lot of the the others in those two shows in particular are just kind of like plodding on with their lives which I definitely don't want to do and um, I want to be going after everything and all the things <laughs> so I'm sure that everything else I want has lots of ambitious people and driven people and confident people in them so that I'm surrounding myself by more people that are like how I want to be and um, it's it's very hard to create those habits isn't it that you want when all your friends around you aren't sort of doing anything aren't designing their own lives they're letting life be very much. Them. well there's that saying isn't it I can't remember who said it now um that you become like the five people you spend the most yeah. time with um and that remember I said to you at the beginning um that I had created this model and design was the first part of that um network is in there too because one of the things i've realized is that these none of these things operates in isolation so when you have goals even when you decide you want to change your habits your environment has an impact your ability to adapt has an impact the people around you have an impact and all of those things collectively make a difference yeah. so if you have people who are actively doing things in the opposite direction to the things you do then you have to compensate somehow or you you probably won't end up sticking with the habits you've set for yourself because you're surrounded by evidence of people doing other things whereas you know if you said i want to run a marathon and everyone in your house was also doing something similar um by the kids all the adults in the house were doing the same thing or, or had some kind of training program so everyone's up early everyone's off doing it Imagine how much easier it would be when your alarm goes off, that the whole house is active and everything's, everyone's moving in that direction versus you're waking up and tiptoeing around the house in the middle of winter to go and do your run when everyone else is curled up in bed and thinks you're crazy for doing it. Those two people are going to have different experiences, aren't they? Um, so there's, you've always got, if you know that's what you face, you actively have to work on the other elements to make sure that you keep topping it up, just like you said. So, you know, the podcasts, the Facebook groups, the kind of social interaction that allows you to feel like you're part of a community that's doing the things you want to do. But it's yeah. definitely easier if there are people in your physical network who are also doing it. Yeah. Is there anything else you feel like you wanted to touch on this evening that we haven't covered? Such an open-ended question. When I get asked it, I'm like, oh, we could go on for days, but... I know. Yeah. They, I mean, habits is such a big topic and I feel like I've left out so much. Um, so I guess the only thing to say is, you know, if people have questions watching the replay or whatever to post those and I can always either record little videos to answer the questions or post comments in the Facebook group or, or send you some content that will help answer those. Um, just because there's, Oh, I mean, we could talk for hours and hours and hours to get really to the root of, all of the stuff and it's so fascinating so if people want to know more i'm more than happy to answer any questions i think habits impact so much like i wish i discovered this this passion for designing my life and therefore discovered that i actually am in control of my habits they are not in control of me and um, so much sooner because it's yeah it's time saving it's making you happier it is creating the life that you actually want so yeah there is one thing actually to say, um, just when you were talking about designing your life and, and going after all these things, I think one of the most important things to look at when you start setting your habits is to look at why the things you're going after matter in the first place. Um, this is one of the things I spoke about in the early episodes of my podcast, that it was an, my experience that I wanted so many things, but only when I sat down and actually thought, if I was the only person left on earth, mm. how badly would I want these things? How much do they matter to me? And how much are they about what I'm trying to project to other people? And that caused me to reflect on what actually matters. So as an example in my business, um, 
I want to write a book. I've got revenue goals and I've got various things that I want to achieve, but my priority is my kids. Mm -hmm. And what I ended up having to do when I sat down and really thought about my habits was to think about why I wanted the money, what I wanted it for, why I wanted the number that I had in my head, why I wanted the book in the first place, why I wanted all those things. And I started to have to go, if I really pair this back and start looking at habits for today, habits for being the parent I want to be, mm. how much do those things really matter when it comes to it? So I guess that whole point about designing your life is take a moment to think about whether these things really genuinely matter to you and whether at the end of your life, when you look back at it, or even in five years or 10 years, when your kids are older and you look back at it, will you go, I'm so glad I developed those habits. I'm so glad I did these things because I feel like they helped. Or are you likely to actually think you've gone in the direction that has led you away from what you said, what, what at the heart of you is what you really do care about. No, I think that's so important. I, I need to, I need to trim down the actual phrasing of it, but the, um, so I'll paraphrase with something I sort of, it's sort of, you know, sometimes things stumble out of your mouth and you're like, that's a golden nugget. Yeah. That's an award-winning speech ending. Um, <laughs> and it was about, I need to write out the exact wording and stick it on my wall. Is with, it was looking at the fitness side of things and it was doing the, do the workout that gives the, you the body you need to live the life you want. Yes. As opposed to going, oh, well, this person has an amazing body. It's not the body you want, but this person has the, an amazing body and they do Zumba. So I'm going to do Zumba and get their amazing body. Well, you don't like Zumba and you don't want to do, you don't actually want their body. You want a different type of an amazing body. You want different definition or different strengths and things like that. And, and it, yeah, it's, I think that's so key with your habits as well. It's create the habits you need to live the life you want to live. And yes. really it is deep down for you. And yes. um, I've, I've got lots of over here, white space on a wall that needs filling. Um, and I've been umming and ahhing over what's going to go up there. And I think I want to get, uh, you know, you can get sticker mm -hmm. words so that looks like it's been painted because I yeah. can't paint very well. Um, I am first, first and foremost a mum. Because for me, that, that is my, my strongest sense of self. It was the thing I always felt like I was meant to be. I never had career ambitions or anything. I wanted to be a mum. Yes. And, and it's funny how still some days when I'm stressing about other things, I need that reminding mm. um, about whether does that actually matter to me being a mum. Now for me, my fitness does, because if I'm not fit and healthy, I won't be here yes. <laughs> to be that mum. So it, but I've really started taking everything back down to that one thing. I'm first and foremost a mum. Yes. And if if everyone could come up with their own defining, I guess, defining statement. And I mean, I'm quite lucky to know that that is my calling in life is to be a mum. Mm. Um, and you can be a mum and have another calling. I want to put that out there. You're defining, just because you're a mum, your defining statement doesn't need to be anything mum related. You may find that you've got a deeper thing um, or a different thing. Not deeper, that's the wrong word. Um, but for me, that is my, my defining statement. Um, yeah. and it makes life so much simpler to be able to take it back to that so whenever yeah I'm creating a new habit and things I'm like I'm first and foremost a mum does this link back to that yeah, yeah. definitely Amazing. Yeah. so most importantly how can we stalk you on social media and other magical things <laughs> online uh you can find me on uh, instagram at big happy life and um, on Facebook, Big Happy Life, or Our Big Happy Life. Um, in fact, I'm saying that it's Big underscore Happy Life. And then on Facebook, because somebody else already had Big underscore Happy Life, I'm Our Big Happy Life on Facebook. Um, my website is bighappylife.co.uk. And I also have a blog, which is bighappylife.blog. 
So the, the blog is just my kind of personal musings and my own journey with my own habits, because although the theory of the stuff is very straightforward, the practicalities of it takes massive effort. So the blog is just kind of me going through some of the efforts I've made to change the habits in my life that were holding me back. Um, and at the moment, that's the, the sum total of, of my presence online. The, the podcast is amazing. Well, we've meant, we briefly mentioned that. We, yes. you've got, you're on a little, you've got a, a series break between series one and series two at the moment. There is so much content to go back through. Um, I'll make sure I link all of this wherever you're finding this video that links to all the information as well. Um, but there is so much inspiration and, and advice and guidance and things in that podcast. It's, yeah, game changer. So, yeah, make sure you go and check that out. Um, you can tag it on. It can become the habit you do after you listen to the Motherhood Motivation, my podcast. Yeah. <laughs> have it, like, clip those two habits together, go from yeah. one to the other. And, and, yeah, so, so much amazing advice in there because I say I'm a bit obsessed with all this so. Well, it would be great if people subscribe to the podcast because the new, um, the one that launches in October has a real, uh, much stronger st structure to it. So I'll be talking about um, kind of developing your philosophy of life, creating your design, and then back tracing it to work out what are the things you need to change? How do you go about doing that? I'll talk about identity and how that affects habits. Um, yeah, there's so much coming up at the end of this year as the podcast relaunches so yeah if you subscribe to it then as soon as it launches you'll be in the know won't miss out amazing well i uh, i suppose all that's left to do is for me to sign off uh so thank you so much for listening and catching up with this uh wherever you found it afterwards thank you so much for being the guest speaker this evening and remember as always that being Remember, don't forget to hit subscribe and turn on your notifications to never miss out on a video again.